It's been weeks since Dustin Blom's severely decomposed body was found in the boot of his car. And police are still searching for at least one other suspect in the brutal killing. Stripper Marishka Robinson, who lived with Blom, is believed to be a crucial part of the police investigation. She was the last person Blom was seen alive with, but exactly what part she allegedly played in his death remains unclear. The investigation into the widowed father's death has revealed suspected links to a syndicate. Welcome to True Crime South Africa. I'm your host, Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to Episode 7, The Body in the Boot. The audio clip you just heard is the voice of Karen Morn, a reporter for ENCI, who covered the case we'll be discussing today. For our international listeners, I'd like to clarify that in South Africa, what you call a trunk of a car, we call a boot. Just in case there are any Americans picturing a body in a shoe-type boot, because that would just be weird. And also not completely out of the realm of possibility where true crime stories are concerned, but still weird. Today's episode was suggested by listener Paula Gruben on our Facebook page. Thanks for listening, Paula, and thank you for your suggestion. If you would like to suggest a case for us to cover, you can contact us on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram, or on our website, truecrimesouthafrica.com. Without further ado, let's get into the case. On the 22nd of September, 2013, security guards patrolling the parking garage at Monte Casino, a casino and shopping complex in Four Ways, South Africa, were bothered by a foul smell. It took them a few minutes to figure out which vehicle it was coming from, and a brown Nissan Qashqai was identified as the source. Police were called and after running the license plates, recognized the vehicle as belonging to a 32-year-old man who had been reported missing the previous day. Torches shone inside the front seating area of the vehicle, picked up no signs of any rotting food or anything else that could be causing the stench. It was decided that there was sufficient reason to force open the boot of the vehicle. Officers popped open the boot and then must have recoiled in horror at what they saw. Crumpled into the tiny space was the badly decomposed body of Dustin Blom. It was a discovery which culminated a year of intense tragedy for the Blom family, and it was the start of an investigation which would lead police to the seedy underworld of sex work, drugs, fraud, and trust betrayed. Dustin Blom had a difficult childhood. He and his sister Julie lost their mother to cancer and their father to brain damage following a serious car accident when they were very young. It is undeniable that these losses caused the siblings to become very close when they found themselves as orphans at a very young age. The feeling that I get, though, is that although their parents were no longer with them, they did have extended family members that rallied around them and both seemed to build strong friendships into their 20s and early 30s. Looking at photographs of their respective weddings, one would never guess that the siblings had experienced such tremendous loss, as both events are recorded as happy occasions filled with loved ones and friends. Dustin was in a relationship in his early 20s with Claudine Whitehead, which produced his first son. The couple parted ways eventually, but remained close, and Dustin was a very big part of his son's life. I was not able to ascertain when Dustin met the woman who would become his wife, but in 2010, he married Talita van der Valt, a beautiful, friendly-looking brunette. Dustin and Talita lived happily as man and wife, their Facebook profiles showing trips to Mauritius, London and Greece, with family and as a couple, and plenty of happy snaps of bras and parties with friends. 
Dustin was working as an IT technician, and the couple were doing well. And in 2012, Talita became pregnant with twins. In March 2013, Talita gave birth to a girl and a boy. But what should have been a joyous occasion for the pair and their families turned into a tragedy when five hours after giving birth, Talita Blom died from complications caused by the delivery. At 32 years old, Dustin Blom was a widower with two newborn babies. In order to give Dustin time to deal with his grief, the babies were cared for by Talita's family and Dustin returned home to an empty house. When he and Talita had left the home they shared in Sharon Lee, a suburb of Randburg, they had expected to return with their babies a few days later and start a new phase of their lives as parents. Instead, Dustin returned without his wife, and although it was intended that the twins would eventually come home to their father, they never would. Dustin spiralled into a deep pit of grief after Talita's death. I did some research into the stages and types of grief, and found that there are four types of grief generally experienced. The first is anticipated grief, which occurs before an expected loss, such as during the time of terminal illness. The second is uncomplicated or so-called normal grief, where the person who has experienced a loss will move through the various stages without becoming stuck in either one and will eventually be able to accept the loss. The third type of grief is what is called disenfranchised grief, where the person has suffered a loss and is unable to publicly display their grief for a variety of reasons. It could be a loss of a pet, where others may not understand an animal's deep meaning in the person's life, or in some situations, even a loss from suicide or drug overdose, where it may be seen as taboo for religious or cultural reasons to mourn such a death. The fourth type of grief is called complicated grief, which is essentially when a person in mourning is either unable to move through their grief or starts to exhibit self-destructive behaviours as a result. It is this latter form of grief that I believe enveloped Dustin after his wife's death. Despite having a support system around him, Dustin began to isolate himself. A life insurance policy for Talita paid out many millions of rands. Dustin began to drink heavily and found it difficult to keep up with his job eventually stopping working completely. He spent a lot of time at a restaurant and pub called The Dross in Olivedale. Dustin was understandably lonely and also started to visit exotic dance lounges, especially the Lollipop Lounge in Randburg. The sex work trade in South Africa, as in many countries, is an underworld run by syndicates whose trade in human flesh is often just an add-on to their real money makers of drug trafficking and fraud. The extent of the dark network which runs beneath the high-class facade of commercial strip clubs was brought to the fore in South Africa in 2010 when Lolly Jackson, a significant kingpin in the strip club world, was murdered in a hit. The details of his and his murderer's connections extended far into organised crime, and in some places, allegedly, even state intelligence agencies. It was in this dark, seedy world that Dustin Blom found himself in 2013. I will say up front that I will always defend the right of women to do any job they choose, and I do believe that sex work should be decriminalised in South Africa. The key word there, though, is choice. Exotic dancing is often a gateway to prostitution, and this is very often not by choice. There are absolutely women who enjoy the acts of stripping or topless dancing, and there's nothing wrong with that. But they are, unfortunately, in the minority, as the majority of women who find themselves in the sex trade 
are there because they have been forced into doing it, either by human traffickers or because they have become addicted to drugs. It is an age-old story where a young girl may start stripping as a means to some easy money with every intention of getting out as soon as they've reached a particular monetary goal. The environment in which they work, though, is so filled with drugs and alcohol that it is not long before they're addicted, and every cent they earn goes to feeding a habit. It's a vicious circle, which has taken many lives and continues to ruin countless others. It did not take long for Dustin to become a regular at the Lollipop Lounge, and even more quickly, the girls working there figured out that he had recently become a widower, and a very rich one at that. Dustin was an attractive man, although his physical appearance quickly started to deteriorate with his intense grief and excessive drinking. He was drowning out his feelings of loss and loneliness, with every substance he could get his hands on. Friends and family noticed his downward spiral with his best friend Ryan Pickford, saying that Dustin did not have a grip on his finances or his health. Ryan would later say about his friend's state of mind, quote, For what I understood, Dustin would wake up and spend most of his afternoons at the Dross in Olivedale, or he would socialise with new friends. He was broken from what happened to his wife. He quickly started dabbling and spending time with the escort woman and in strip clubs. End quote. Dustin was known to be a generous and big hearted man, and it was this combination of generosity and deep grief that brought Marushka Robinson into his life. Marushka is a tall, extremely attractive, 24-year-old brunette, and at the time she met Dustin, she was a dancer at the Lollipop Lounge in Randburg, where she performed under the stage name Angelique. She had been working there for three years, and was deep into the scene, having developed a drug habit. The relationship between Dustin and Marushka has never been described as sexual. It seems that Marushka had opened up to Dustin about some personal problems she was experiencing, and she indicated that she wanted to change her life. Of course, I cannot say whether there was any honesty in this statement from Marushka's side, but her future actions make me believe that, in Dustin, she saw a soft target, someone who was lost and lonely, and of course, very rich. Dustin told Marushka that she could leave her job as a dancer, and he would provide her with a rent-free room in his house so that she could take time to get clean and get her life back on track. Marushka jumped at the chance, and by May 2013, this unlikely pair were sharing a home. Despite her apparent desire to leave her past behind, Marushka had brought a very large piece of that life into Dustin's home on regular occasions. Her 32-year-old boyfriend, Jean-Pierre Milan, known as JP, visited her often, and she continued using drugs with him. On the 25th of May, Dustin Blom was arrested for driving under the influence. I can only assume that he did not want his family and friends finding out, so instead he called Marushka, gave her his banking details, PIN and bank card, and asked her to withdraw money from his account so that he could pay his bail. It was this decision, more than anything else in my opinion, that led to Dustin's eventual downfall. He trusted Marushka, and instead of behaving in a manner that supported that trust, she passed the banking information on to her boyfriend, J.P. Milan. This began a series of fraudulent transactions by the pair, using Dustin's account. It was estimated that Marushka and JP had stolen hundreds of thousands of rands from Dustin's account during the period between May and September 2013. It would later be revealed that Marushka would drug Dustin with a drug GHB, also known as gamma-hydroxybutyrate, 
which is commonly used as a date rape drug. She would inject a box of wine Dustin was drinking from and wait for him to fall asleep. JP would then take Dustin's bank card and draw money from his account, while Marushka waited at the house for the notification of withdrawal to come through on Dustin's cell phone. She would then delete this message so that Dustin would have no idea when he woke up that his card had been used as, by then, it was placed back into his wallet and left exactly where it had been before he passed out. Dustin's friend Ryan would later say that he knew that his friend had absolutely no control of his finances at that time due to his disorientated state of mind, and he was not surprised that Dustin would not have realised money was missing from his account. During this time, Dustin dated a few girls he had met at the Lollipop Lounge, but these were never serious relationships. On the 3rd of September 2013, Dustin met an escort at the Penthouse, which is an upper-class escort agency. Her name was withheld from public record, and she was referred to as Tracy. Tracy would later describe having a connection with Dustin, and she said that he was the first client she had ever seen outside of work. In both escort work and strip clubs, it is a known rule that workers are not allowed to fraternise with clients outside of their workplaces. I guess this could be a safety precaution to avoid putting the woman in situations they cannot control, but I tend to think that it's far more about the money. After all, if these women form intimate relationships with their clients outside their workplaces, they're essentially giving away their boss's product for free. I guess it's a sort of restraint of trade for sex workers. Tracy, of course, knew that she was taking a risk, but she seems to have liked Dustin enough to continue seeing him. She would later say that on the day of their first meeting, Dustin had invited her back to his house, but when she had found out that Marushka Robinson was living with him, she had declined to go there. The woman had apparently worked with Marushka, at the lollipop lounge at some stage, and deeply disliked her. Dustin and Tracy had started a relationship and gone on several dates, with her eventually agreeing to start visiting him at his house. This would be another point in the story that would steer it to its eventual, horrifying conclusion. The regular presence of Tracy at Dustin's home put a spanner in the works of Marushka and JP's scams. It was becoming more difficult to get Dustin alone in order to drug him. Details would also later emerge that make me think that Dustin was starting to realise that something untoward was going on. There's a series of text messages between Marushka and JP, which was made public. I'll go into detail later about all of them, but one particular message warrants mentioning now. Marushka messaged JP the following. Quote, He is going to get cops here. Come here so we can G him up. End quote. G is the street name for GHB. Why would Marushka say that he, and she can only be referring to Dustin there, is going to call the cops. Had he figured out what she and JP had been doing? Or perhaps Dustin felt that Marushka was not living up to her side of the deal in terms of straightening out her life, and he wanted her to leave and she refused. Either way, there was definitely a pressure forming in the relationship between the two. It was also around this time that Dustin seemed to be coming to the realisation that his own life had gone completely off track due to his grief. A friend of his, who was a yoga instructor in Bali, had convinced him to book a trip there, to detox and give himself a break. Dustin had agreed, and he'd already secured a visa to travel, booked his flights and accommodation. He was turning a corner in his grief journey, perhaps realising that his children needed him, and that the path he was on would only lead to destruction. 
This, of course, would not suit the two people who had been benefiting from his downward spiral. A detox Dustin could not be drugged and robbed, and if he managed to clear his mind enough to bring his babies home, there was no way he was going to have the likes of Marushka and JP living in the same house as them. The couple's cash cow was about to leave town, and that just wouldn't do. Both Marushka and JP would later deny that any of the events that followed were premeditated, or that they had panicked when Dustin began to clean himself up. The evidence that would be led, however, would tell a very different story. Dustin Blum was last seen alive in the very early hours of the 18th of September, 2013. He was seen leaving the Dross in Olivedale with an unidentified woman. On the 21st of September, 2013, Dustin's ex and the mother of his oldest son, Claudine Whitehead, reported Dustin as missing after he had not been seen or heard from in three days. Dustin was not at his house, and his brown Nissan Qashqai was also missing. By the time police found Dustin's body at Monte Cassino and his house was searched, Marushka Robinson had moved out. CCTV footage played a major role in this case, as the entrance to the parking garage in which Dustin's car was found was covered by cameras. Police reviewed this footage and noted that Dustin's car had entered the parking garage at Monte Cassino at 5 minutes to 2 on the afternoon of the 19th of September. It had entered the fourth level of parking, where it had been found four days later. There were no cameras on the parking level to indicate what had occurred after the vehicle entered the parking garage. I'm going to make a few assumptions here about how police arrived at the doorstep of Marushka Robinson, but given the evidence available to us, I don't think it is too far off the reality. It was no secret that Marushka had been living with Dustin, and she had also made a very sudden departure from his home, coinciding with him going missing. Considering her lifestyle, the fact that she had access to Dustin's bank accounts, and that there were withdrawals made on his accounts after Dustin's death, it could not have taken much for police to draw the line between A and B. In fact, police moved so quickly on this case that Marushka Robinson was arrested on the 23rd of September, the day after Dustin's body was found. She appeared in Randburg Magistrates Court on the 25th of September 2013, on charges of murder and robbery. On the 26th of September, J.P. Milan was located at a Randburg hotel, where he had been hiding out. He was found in possession of several fake identity documents. He appeared in court the next day, facing the same charges as his girlfriend. Initially, the pair were a united front. They would hold hands in court and sit closely. By the time the trial was due to start, however, the pair appeared to have ended their relationship and did not even make eye contact with one another. This makes sense and is a regular occurrence in cases like these, where the perpetrators are close. Even family members will turn against each other when they face a murder charge. There was a Facebook page that was started during the trial called The Marushka Robinson Story. The page posted links to each article related to the case as it unfolded. The administrator of this page made an interesting observation about Marushka and JP's split. The admin wondered whether it hadn't been an orchestrated attempt by the pair to create reasonable doubt. When the trial started, their versions were polar opposites, and so much so, that it would become difficult to ascertain which was the more probable. I wouldn't put it past it to you to have concocted a plan to confuse matters. Both Marushka and JP 
initially pleaded not guilty to all charges against them. Both were denied bail. The trial date was postponed on many occasions. Although JP had started out using a private defence attorney paid for by his family, the money for this quickly ran out, and both he and Marishka were appointed legal aid attorneys. The various delays meant that the legal aid attorneys had to be juggled, and by the time JP was on his third attorney, before the trial had even started, his mother made a statement to the press, saying that if her son was guilty, he deserved to serve his sentence, but she did not feel he was going to get a fair trial if his attorneys were constantly being swapped. In his initial appearances, JP had long hair tied into a ponytail. At his very first appearance, he begged journalists not to take his picture because he claimed that he'd been arrested only wearing pants. He had to borrow a vest from a fellow prisoner and the vest had swear words on, which was embarrassing to him. His pleas were ignored, and he was photographed barefoot and cradling his face to avoid it being shown. After the trial started, he suddenly looked more like an accountant than a drug-dealing fraudster upon murder charges. His hair was cut neatly, and he wore collared shirts, ties and smart jerseys. Marushka's most dramatic change in appearance was in her weight. No longer having access to the drugs which had no doubt caused her to remain as frightfully thin as she had been before her arrest, she gained weight and rounded out, looking less angular and more like the average young woman on the street. A close-up shot of her as she sat in court showed scars on the bottom half of her arms. These were not the track marks of a drug addict, but rather scar tissue healed over what looked like slashes, perhaps the remnants of self-harming or an altercation with the blade. The trial eventually started in April 2015, more than a year after the death of Dustin Blom. A pathologist testified that Dustin Blom had died on the 18th of September 2013. His cause of death had been asphyxiation, and although the pathologist could not rule out that strangulation had been the cause of the suffocation, she could not categorically say that it was. Ligature marks were found around Dustin's neck, and the hyoid bone in his neck was broken, which the pathologist confirmed would have had to have been the result of a significant amount of pressure being applied to the neck. Dustin was also found to have blunt force injuries to his head, which did not contribute directly to his death, but did cause hemorrhaging in his brain. Although both the defendants had pleaded not guilty to the robbery charge as well, they both ended up admitting stealing money from Dustin. But that was where their stories diverged. The following is Marushka's version of events. She claims that in the early hours of the 18th of September, her and JP were in her room at Dustin's house, shooting up drugs, when she heard Dustin return home. She went to look for him and claimed to find him sleeping on the couch downstairs. Marushka then claims that JP had suggested that they steal money from Dustin, but she had been against this as she would not have been able to drug him if he was already sleeping. This left the risk, according to her, that he would wake up while she was deleting messages from his phone, or that he would realise his bank card was gone. Marushka claims that JP had suggested that he put Dustin in a so-called sleeper hold, like wrestlers did on TV, to render him unconscious. A sleeper hold is actually a martial arts move, which is used to temporarily render a person unconscious in order to get them under control. It is often taught as a means of self-defense, but every source I looked at warned that it should only ever be used in extreme circumstances. The idea is to use your dominant arm to grip the person's neck so that their throat is essentially in the crook of your elbow. You then use your non-dominant hand to press the person's neck into your other arm, 
temporarily blocking off oxygen flow to the brain. Every source I read also said that it is imperative to release the grip as soon as the person's body goes limp, as it is very easy to go too far and completely strangle the person. In Marishka's version, she does not say that she had told JP it was a bad idea. She simply waited, according to her, in the bedroom, while JP went downstairs to perform this move on Dustin. She claims that after a little while, she heard what sounded like furniture moving. She stated that JP had then come back upstairs with a bank card and said he was going to draw money. She claims that he was gone for much longer than it usually took him to draw money, but because of her drugged state, she could not say how long he was gone for. When she heard JP come back, she had gone downstairs and found Dustin laying on the floor. She says that JP returned with another man called Terence. She had noticed that Dustin had a bloody nose, and she put her fingers under his nose to see if he was breathing, but could not feel any airflow. She says that Terence and JP had then told her that Dustin was dead. Marishka claims to have been shocked and afraid when she heard this, and had insisted they call the police, to which JP had said, that if she called the police, he was leaving, and she would be left with a dead body to explain. Terence had left the property, and JP had also left separately a short while later, only returning in the afternoon. When he returned, he had suggested that they put Dustin's body into his vehicle, and they could dispose of it later. Marishka agreed to this. She said that they had put Dustin's body into the vehicle, after which she had cleaned up the bloody trail with towels. She had then put some of the bloody towels into a black rubbish bag and dumped them in a field across the road from Dustin's house. Some of the towels didn't have much blood on them, so she'd washed them in the washing machine and hung them up to dry. Marishka claims that she and JP had left the premises in Dustin's cash car on the evening of the 18th of September, and gone to Monte Casino, where they drew money out of Dustin's account and gambled until the early hours of the morning. They had then gone to Dion Wired to buy a few electronic items. It blows my mind that these people were driving around in a car with a dead body in the boot, and then gambled and shopped for heaven knows how long with this car in the parking lot. Does that say accidental death that they are shocked and terrified by to you? Nope, me neither. So, a small divergence here. I've just realized that I use the phrase, it blows my mind, a lot. I was asked when we're going to be doing some True Crime South Africa merch, and I think our first t-shirts and coffee mugs are going to have to say, it blows my mind, on them. Anyway, back to the soulless murderers on an electronics shopping spree. Marishka claims that JP then dropped her off at Randburg Inn and told her to book in there. She says that he joined her later in the day and told her that he had left Dustin's vehicle at Monte Casino. I initially really struggled to follow Marishka's version as... It almost sounded as though she was saying that JP had dropped Dustin's body off on the 18th, which we know from CCTV is not true. I then realized that she was actually referring to the 19th, and the reason I was confused was because she never spoke about sleeping. Drug addicts, of course, can go days without sleeping, and this is exactly what they did. From at least the morning of the 18th, to the evening of the 19th, when Marushka claims to have been dropped off at Rainburg Inn. Neither of them had slept a wink. JP pointed the finger, solely at Marushka in his version of events. He claimed that in the early hours of the 18th of September, she had asked for a sleeping pill to give Dustin, so that they could steal from him again. He said that once Marushka had told him that Dustin was asleep, he had gone to make the withdrawals, 
but had car problems and had asked a friend to collect him. He claimed that they had tried to draw money, but the pin Marushka had given them was wrong, and they had to return to the house to get the correct pin. He said that they'd entered through a side entrance and therefore never saw Dustin. He said they left the house for the rest of the day and only returned later on the evening of the 18th of September when he was only in Marushka's room. She had told him that Dustin had asked them to draw money for groceries. They went to Olivedale Shopping Centre and withdrew large amounts of cash. Around midnight, they went to Monte Casino where they drew more money and gambled on the high rollers tables. CCTV showed them happily chatting to cashiers, pinching each other's bums and giggling. According to JP's version, he was unaware of Dustin's death at this point. According to him, Marushka had concealed Dustin's death from him for 24 hours, and he had only discovered the man was dead when they came back to the house on the morning of the 19th and found Dustin lying in a pool of blood. Marushka had then told him that Dustin had died from an overdose because she had given him too much GHB. JB claimed that he felt he was involved because he had supplied the GHB, so he had helped Marushka to get rid of the body. He admitted to driving Dustin's vehicle to Monte Casino with his body in the boots and leaving it there. He denied having strangled Dustin or having any other involvement in his death other than disposing of his body. So let's unpack the differences in testimony here. Both agree that Dustin was last seen alive in the early hours of the 18th of September. Marushka acknowledges that he died then, according to her, by strangulation at the hands of J.P. J.P., however, says that he had no idea Dustin was dead until the next day, and that he believed he had died from a drug overdose. We know that Dustin died from strangulation, so Marushka's version rings more true here, and if J.P.'s version is correct, that means that Marushka would have had to have strangled Dustin, which is highly unlikely considering how much strength it would have taken to firstly control a 110-kilogram victim, but also to break his hyoid bone. Marushka claims that they moved the body into the car on the 18th and drove around with it. JP says they moved the body into the car on the 19th. Again, as well as it sounds, Marushka's version is more likely. Dustin was not missing at this point, and he'd isolated himself from friends and family, to such a point that it was unlikely that anyone would have realised he was missing right away. It would not make sense to leave the body in the house overnight, as that was a huge risk. If they had a body with them, although a risk if they got pulled over or the car had been stolen, they had better control over the situation. JP claims that when they were at Monte Casino gambling, He had no idea Dustin was dead, but as the prosecutor would point out, they had Dustin's bank card with them, and they didn't have his cell phone. In the past, they had made very quick transactions and deleted the notification messages from Dustin's phone, but now suddenly they felt comfortable enough to leave for hours and not worry about Dustin waking up. That, the prosecutor said, was because JP knew very well that Dustin was dead. Their happy demeanour shown on CCTV footage at Monte Cassino was explained by JP by saying he didn't know Dustin was dead, so he had nothing to worry about. Marushka, on the other hand, said that it was because they used a lot of drugs, so they were not acting normally. JP admitted to having been alone when he left the vehicle at the parking garage on the afternoon of the 19th. The blood is also a discrepancy. JP describes a huge pool of blood that was so vast that in order to move Dustin's body, he had no choice but to stand in it. Marushka does talk about blood, but she only mentions blood coming from his nose and nowhere near the vast amounts her boyfriend mentioned. 
I believe that the blood coming from Dustin's mouth and nose was caused by the hemorrhaging in his brain, and these were the escape routes for that build-up of blood. I tend to think that, while there would have been a significant amount, the giant pool that JP described was over-exaggerated. A printout of 1,800 pages of text messages that were recovered from Marishka and JP's phones indicated that the act was very possibly premeditated. In the days before the murder, they had discussed the possibility that Dustin was going to go to Bali. On the morning of the murder, at 17 minutes past six, Marishka sent JP the message I referred to earlier. Quote, he is going to get the cops. Get here so we can G him up. End quote. JP later replied, quote, You think he is awake? Did you give him G? End quote. In another message later that morning to JP, Marushka said, quote, Baby, just make sure we get the money. Love you. Kiss, kiss. End quote. At 11 o'clock that morning, JP sent Marushka a message saying, quote, Go check for more passwords. End quote. A taxi driver who had driven JP and Marushka around between the 18th and 20th of September also testified in court. He said that on the morning of the 18th of September, Marushka had called him and told him that JP needed his services for the day. He collected JP from a guest house in Randburg at around 10 o'clock in the morning. He said JP initially told him to take him to Marushka's house, but on the way they had to stop to fetch another guy from an engine garage nearby. He didn't hear the man's name. I will note here that when the taxi driver refers to Marushka's house, he actually means Dustin Blom's house. The taxi driver was then asked to stop at an ATM. JP gave an ATM card to his friend, who went to the ATM and then came back to the car and said something to JP, who then got out of the car himself and went to the ATM. He came back saying something about the pin being wrong. The driver then took both men to Marushka's house. They went inside for a while and then came back out separately. This was around 11 o'clock. This account fits in with what Marushka said about a man called Terence coming back to the house with JP. What was interesting was that this would have been when, according to Marushka, they had told her that Dustin was dead. But when asked whether the men behaved any differently after they came out of the house, particularly Terence, who I assume had just seen Dustin's dead body for the first time, he said, no, they acted the same, very normal. The taxi driver then continued to explain quite a convoluted series of pickups and drop-offs, which involved at least one other man. His testimony ended with him saying that the last time he picked up Marushka and JP from Dustin's house, she had a black rubbish bag with her that had something in it, but he didn't know what. I would assume that these would be the bloody towels that Marushka had referred to, but she had said that she'd dumped them in the field across the road from Dustin's house. There were quite a few small details about Marushka and JP's testimonies that didn't line up with either the physical evidence or the witness testimony. I think there are two factors represented here. Firstly, the two defendants had initially seemed to deny everything, but the prosecutors got them to admit their involvement in quite a few of the elements, such as the theft, for example, and that left the stories that they had concocted to claim their innocence with holes the size of Kilimanjaro in them. The second factor we need to consider is that these people were chronic drug addicts. Even if they had wanted to, their recall would probably have been poor at best. 
One of the other witnesses that testified for the prosecution was the escort who had allegedly been dating Dustin in the days before his death. The woman had known Marushka as an ex-colleague and not liked her. Initially, she had refused to visit Dustin at his home because of Marushka's presence, but had eventually relented and started attending the home on a few occasions. She testified in court that she had been at the house on the 17th of September, the day before Dustin was murdered. She had been invited into Marushka's bedroom, and although she didn't like the woman, she felt it impolite to decline, so she went with. JP had entered the room shortly afterwards, and this was the first time she had met him. Marushka then claimed that Dustin had said he would buy her a car if she could save 10,000 rand. I assume that this was Dustin's way of trying to get Marushka to start working towards a goal. Clearly, he was still hoping that he could help her to sort her life out. The woman then told the court that Marushka had laughed, and with an arrogant smirk on her face, she had said that it was easy to get 10,000 rand. JP had nodded his agreement. JP had then asked Marushka to check their party pack. The woman saw Marushka reach for a black backpack and pull out a large quantity of GHB, LSD, and the drug CAT. CAT is an amphetamine with effects similar to cocaine and tuck. The woman had said that her reaction was that that was a lot of drugs for just two people. JP and Marushka had responded by saying that it was for a celebration, because, quote, soon they were going to have a reason to celebrate, end quote. Dustin had then returned home and taken the woman out for lunch, and then taken her home. This was the last time she had seen Dustin Blom alive. The woman also testified that when she had been advised that Dustin was missing, she had called Marushka to see if she knew anything and to tell her that they were going to be forming a search party to try and find Dustin. The woman alleges that Marushka had laughed and said that she definitely wouldn't be joining in the search. It would also emerge that Ryan Pickford, Dustin's best friend, had contacted Marushka, pressing her for answers in the days after Dustin's disappearance. Marushka had said to Ryan that she would like to meet with him. When she was asked in court about this, she said that Dustin had always told her that if anything ever happened to him, she should contact Ryan. Marushka claims that she wanted to tell Ryan what had happened to Dustin because she felt it was the right thing to do. She never ended up meeting with Ryan because she was arrested the next day. But if she had really wanted to do the right thing, in my opinion, she should have stopped JP from putting Dustin in a chokehold in the first place. By not doing that, she forced Ryan Pickford to have to identify his best friend's badly decomposed body after they had left him in his car for almost a week. Marushka, in my opinion, has no idea what the definition of the right thing is. The other men involved that the taxi driver had referred to were arrested while the trial was ongoing. There were four men who were charged with fraud and theft. It emerged that these men were associates of J.P. Milan's, and he had given them Dustin's credit cards to use. I could not find any further information about whether these men were convicted or whether the infamous Terence was among them. Terence, in my opinion, should at the very least have been charged with being an accessory to Dustin's murder. Shortly after these men were arrested, however, the house of the investigating officer was broken into, and the only thing that was rifled through was his work documents. It was assumed that this had been a ploy to try and get their hands on the case dockets of either the murder case or the fraud case against the four men. Thankfully, the officer did not have the dockets on him at the time, but the robbers had taken his state identity card. There was concern that this would be used to try and gain access to the defendants and either perform a hit on them to silence them 
or break them out of custody. For the rest of the trial, special security officers were present in the court in order to ensure everyone's safety. This just tells me how deep into the underworld all these people were. Who has the kahunas to break into the investigating officer's house, and what were they trying to protect exactly? It couldn't have been these small-time guys that have been arrested. It just makes me wonder where the trail of breadcrumbs would have led. I think that the real events of the morning of the 18th of September were a mix between the statements of JP and Marushka. We know that Dustin did not die of a drug overdose. He died of asphyxiation, most probably caused by strangling. I don't believe that Marushka was physically capable of strangling Dustin, so JP must have done this. The blood and head injuries are unexplained by either account, though. I think that there may have been a struggle between Dustin and JP when Marushka says that she heard the furniture moving. Perhaps JP hit Dustin's head into a piece of furniture or against the floor and then strangled him to death. The judge eventually found J.P. Milan guilty of murder, as well as the robbery charges, and Marushka Robinson guilty of being an accessory to murder, and also the robbery with aggravating circumstances charges. In a pre-sentencing hearing, the defence and prosecution will present mitigating and aggravating evidence toward sentencing. So essentially, the defence will try and lessen the sentence by presenting psychological evidence, character witnesses and other evidence, while the prosecution will present evidence to try and maximise the sentence. So this will be when victim impact statements are read, and psychologists that may have aggravating testimony about mental illness will testify. In the pre-sentencing hearing for JP and Marushka, a probation officer took the stand. She had consulted with JP after his arrest. The probation officer testified that when she had interviewed him, he had admitted to strangling Dustin. He had told the woman that he and Marushka would drug Dustin and use his bank cards. He said that on this occasion, Dustin had woken up and he didn't know what to do, so he strangled him. As the hearing continued the next day, J.P. Milan asked to address the court. He then admitted to all present that he had killed Dustin Blom. It was the 18th of August, 2015, exactly one month shy of two years since Dustin had been murdered and he had forced Dustin's family and friends to live through a devastating, protracted trial and delay their grieving process, simply because it suited him. And then he admitted it, like he was some sort of hero for doing so. In her victim impact statement, which she read out to the court, Dustin's sister Julie said that her brother had a great big heart and he was loved by all who knew him. She said that Dustin was a devoted husband, loving father, caring brother and loyal friend. She said that, quote, In such a short lifetime, my brother suffered not only the unbearable, tragic loss of his beloved wife, Talita, but we also lost our mother to cancer and our father to brain damage following a severe car accident when we were young. End quote. Marushka Robinson was sentenced to 29 years imprisonment in total, 10 years for being an accessory to murder after the fact, and 19 years for the cumulative charges of fraud and robbery with aggravating circumstances. J.P. Milan received a life sentence, as well as an additional 10 years for obstruction of justice, 7 years for four counts of fraud, 
15 years for robbery with aggravating circumstances, and 18 months each for five counts of identity fraud. Everyone affected by this tragic story received a life sentence too, though. Dustin's twins are being raised by Talita's sister, and I cannot help but think how history has horribly repeated itself here. Dustin and Julie grew up without parents because of two separate tragic events which robbed them of their mother and father, and Dustin's youngest son and daughter will also grow up without their mother and father. Dustin's oldest son, who was old enough to have had a significant bond with his father, had experienced perhaps one of the most devastating events a child will ever endure. Dustin's sister Julie has to find a way to continue the rest of her life without her brother, to whom she was so closely bonded. It would be easy to point at addiction and say this is what led to the murders. After all, it was predominantly drugs that Marushka and JP would buy with the money they stole. That doesn't cut it in my books, though. It was simply pure greed. Marushka was being helped by Dustin. He was doing his best to try and help her to get back on track. But I don't believe she ever had any intention of doing that. She knew from the day she moved into Dustin's house that she was going to milk this broken man for everything he had. J.P. Milan was a career criminal. He had probably been lying and stealing his entire life. In Marushka... He found someone as greedy as he was, and just as cold-hearted. For this pair, the world revolves around them, and no one else matters, as long as they get what they want. I firmly believe that if Dustin had been given the chance, he would have pulled himself out of his grief. He would have gone to Bali and detoxed, and maybe that wouldn't have been the end of his troubles, but I do believe that he would have been the father to his babies that they needed. He had already proven he was a responsible father to his oldest son. Dustin got sucked into his grief, and I believe, after a lifetime of loss, his wife's passing was just too much for him. He got caught up in a cycle of self-destruction, which often comes with complicated grief. Unfortunately for him, there were two predators watching, and thanks to them, he never got the chance to pull himself out. Thank you for listening to Episode 7 of True Crime South Africa. I've been asked by a few people how they can help support the show, which I really appreciate. I have a few options at the moment, which you can access on our website at truecrimesouthafrica.com. I'm an Amazon affiliate and I have a few book links on my website. If you click on these links to order books, True Crime South Africa will get a portion of the sale from Amazon. When you click on the link, you're redirected to the Amazon website. Sometimes the product will open in US dollars, but if you look at the top of the page, you can change your currency to rands. I always recommend buying the books in e-version from Amazon as unfortunately at this point, Amazon doesn't ship all of its products to South Africa. On the Amazon website, the e-version is labelled as a Kindle version, but you can read the books on any device, as Amazon provides a free e-reader app. I'm also looking into a few other affiliate options, but I want them to be products that I know will add value to you. I will open a page on the website with all the options you can use to help support the show. Merchandise like t-shirts and mugs have also been requested, and I'll be looking at that soon too. At the end of the day, the best way to support True Crime South Africa is to listen, share, and recommend us to your like-minded friends, which is exactly what you've all been doing. I really appreciate the amazing support you've shown for the show, and for the victims whose stories we tell. Once again, thank you for listening to Dustin's story, and if you enjoyed this episode, please follow us on Facebook, 
Twitter, or Instagram. I'll also upload each episode to YouTube, and the transcripts and photographs relating to each episode are available on our website. I'll chat to you in our next episode.